I am sure most of your parents must have on occasions put curbs on your liberties and stopped you from doing certain things. At least I have experienced this on many occasions. So if you got poor marks in exams and next exams are around, we were not allowed to go out and play. But as usually is our nature as child to plead before our parents to let us go. And the parents also sometimes used to let us go putting certain conditions like come before 7 p.m. or complete your homework first and then go or promise to complete learning a chapter from your study book. And sometimes if you do something really notorious as a child, they lock you up in the room and your parents don't allow you to go anywhere. Well, in the first scenario, your parents had granted you bail. Whereas in second scenario, your bail was rejected by your parents. Let's see what bail really is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Namaskar and welcome to Law Charcha. Most crucial part of criminal jurisprudence and something that directly concerns the liberty of an individual, bail. The example about parents which I gave you was to simplify the understanding of the provisions. So, bail means release of a person from legal custody. Such release can be upon some conditions like a personal bond, a surety or a security. Granting of a bail is a discretionary power of the court. Therefore, there is no strict thumb rule as regards granting or rejecting of the bail. Of course, in a bailable offence, bail has to be granted and in such cases, the discretion would be only what conditions to put. And where do we find or get to know whether an offence is bailable or non-bailable? Any guesses? Well, viewers who have seen my earlier video would know it. It is in the first schedule of CRPC where classification of offences is done like this. So, second last column, billable and non billable Now, as I have mentioned earlier, there is no thumb rule for granting bail. Though, a fundamental human rule which has been recognized by courts over a period of time is that bail itself is a rule and jail is an exception. This rule could also find its base in the principle that innocent until proven guilty. So primarily, the court should ensure liberty of a person unless that liberty can jeopardize the investigation or the proceedings. Because bail is a discretion of the court, it is the courts who have over a period of time formulated the guidelines to grant bail. I will certainly recommend reading amongst recent judgments the Taram Singh's judgment. This is the citation. Because this case talks about criminal jurisprudence and the basic principles of bail. Now, though I said that granting bail is discretion of the court, the wordings of section 437 are so formulated that it initially relaxes the granting of bail and then has put situations in which this process of granting of bail is made restrictive. First situation is where it is said that if it reasonably appears that offences for which individual is guilty is punishable with death or life imprisonment. Second situation is where the person has committed a cognizable offence and was earlier convicted for offence punishable where imprisonment was more than 7 years like 7 years or more or where he was convicted on 2 or more occasions earlier for a non billable and cognizable offence. Further you can also see special provision is there for releasing an individual who is under 16 years of age then also for a woman and person who is sick or infirm. Similarly, if you see the subsection 2 is again more liberal section where it is said that if the courts think that there are no reasonable grounds to believe that accused has committed a non billable offence but there is a scope of further enquiry then he can be released on bail. 
Now it is interesting to read why this line, but that there are sufficient grounds to further inquiry into his guilt and so on. Because in absence of these words, it would just mean that the courts do not believe that accused has committed offence, nor there are sufficient grounds to proceed. If that is so, then what is the point in even proceeding against the accused? Why not just discharge him? This is the wonderful part of drafting a statute. So to enable to proceed as well as protect the liberty of the accused and follow principle of innocent until proven guilty, such provisions are drafted. As we move forward in this section, I want to point out an important aspect of the time frame of the whole judicial proceedings and its practical implications. If you see subsection 6 here, it says that if a trial is not concluded within 60 days, then the accused is entitled for bail. But importantly, this period of 60 days would begin from the first date of evidence. I must tell viewers that often this first date of evidence itself takes months and also years to come. In this regards, it becomes important to know at what stage provisions of bail become relevant. Bail is usually sought at different stages. During the investigation, after the filing of charge sheet, or during hearing of an appeal. During investigation, an individual may be arrested and then released on bail. Here sometimes even before arrest, an individual may seek bail under section 438 known as pre-arrest bail, which I will deal with in separate video. Then after the filing of chat sheet, the accused may be arrested or accused may also surrender and he, be, he can be granted bail. I will have a separate video on surrender as well. In an appeal against conviction also, a convict can seek bail pending the hearing and final disposal of the appeal. So what are the usual considerations while granting bail at different stages? Say when the investigation is underway, one could be chances of the accused absconding, Second could be chances of the accused tampering the evidence or influencing the witness. Third could be probability of him committing another offence, maybe to cover up the present offence by killing a witness, murder of the witness. Fourth could be his background, what surroundings he comes from, whether he has a past history of committing offences, whether he has any antecedents. Fifthly, will he be uh, will he try to evade the investigation if he is granted bail and will he breach conditions imposed by the uh, by the court while granting bail now if the chat sheet is filed the considerations change a little bit so the tampering of the evidence aspect may not be that important or relevant so such a in such a situation in court's language it is regarded as change in circumstance. So the bail is sought because there is change in circumstance. That is, for instance, the investigation is complete and chat sheet is now filed. So this is change in circumstance. A high court or a sessions court can direct release of, an, uh, of a person on bail or modify conditions imposed while granting bail or even cancel bail granted by the magistrate if there is any breach in conditions or it is found necessary that the accused granted bail has to be taken into custody. What are these terms personal bond, surety or security? Are usko bond pe chhod diya. You must have heard this, isn't it? Are usko chhodwane ke liye koi solvent surety chahiye. But ye hai kya? Well, Answer to these you will find in second schedule of CRPC which contains various forms. For example, let's see this in the second schedule. The first part is with respect to the personal bond where the accused himself has to kind of undertake to appear before the police officer or the court failing which he binds himself to pay certain amount to the government. Now if the court thinks that the chances of accused binding himself uh, to be present before the court is doubtful or uncertain, then the court can order to furnish bond from a surety. 
Now this is where the second part comes into picture and the court usually would specify one or two solvent sureties of an X amount. Now solvent means who can afford to pay to the government the amount specified in the bond. So the sureties who are individuals also have to appear before the court wherein the judge then checks their identity and also whether they are solvent or not and then allows the individual to be surety for the accused. And when more than one surety is allowed for X amount, for instance 50,000 rupees, that means surety of 25,000 rupees each can be furnished when there are two sureties. The intent of all this exercise is to secure appearance of the accused during the entire proceedings. It is a kind of common sense mid path wherein the liberty of the accused is not curtailed as well as his presence before the court is secured. Some of you might be thinking, what happens if the person arrested and to be released on bail is a minor? Can he be made to furnish a bond himself? Certainly not. Please note, his presence will have to be secured with bond executed by a surety or sureties only. I must also mention that sureties can seek discharge by making an application before the court. So, if you have become a surety of a person in a particular case, or proceedings and now no longer want to continue to be such surety then you can apply to the court and get a discharge in such event the court will issue warrant to the accused for whom you stood as surety and ask him to furnish another surety and if he fails to do so he may be sent to jail these were the conditions of securing bail let's come back to the parameters of granting bail and know how the law through the higher courts have been propounded on the subject. I have referred to uh, Dattaram Singh's judgment earlier which has lucidly put the consideration to be kept in mind while granting bail. The Supreme Court has reiterated the principle of bail is a rule and jail is an exception by relying upon a pre-independence judgment of Calcutta High Court passed in the year 1924 wherein it was held that bail is not to be withheld as a punishment. This pre-independence judgment of the Calcutta High Court also held that the test applied for whether bail should be granted or not is 1 the nature of the accusation, second, the nature of evidence in support of such accusation, third, the severity of the punishment which conviction will entail. I believe section 437 actually is drafted on these principles. Another pre-independence judgment that Supreme Court referred was Allahabad High Court's judgment which also observed that grant of bail is the rule and refusal is exception. Friends, why I emphasized on the fact that these judgments are of pre-independence era is to put down the perception that people carry that laws should change. Well, not always that is needed. I would say old laws have been based on sound common law principles that considered fabric of civilization much better than now. The change in morals make us believe that laws should change. But who is responsible for downwards transition of morality? Something that needs introspection. Maybe it's not always that laws need change. It's the execution that bring about a better use of a particular law. Well, this was all about bail. I will see you soon for doing charcha on anticipatory bail. You can subscribe to this channel and watch videos on arrest, custody and related subjects. Thank you. Namaskar.